Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church Wednesday night. You're not going to forget tonight's service. You say, oh, no, no, no. You're, you're not going to forget tonight's service. So glad you guys are here. We um, are online right now, so we want to welcome all the ones that are tuned in right now out there on YouTube and all kinds of platforms out there and Radio by Grace now live happening. You guys in the room are live, right? Okay, we're going through the Bible book by book, and we've made our way all the way to 1 Kings. Um, 1 Kings is one of my favorite books in the Bible, and so uh, we're going to watch the Bible Project right now, tagging First and Second Kings, so just to get your history in order, watch this video. The books of First and Second Kings Although they're two separate books in our Bibles, they were originally written as one book telling a unified story that continues on from the book of Samuel that came before it. So David has unified the tribes of Israel into a kingdom, and God promised that from his line would come a messianic king who would establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill the promises made to Abraham. So the book of Kings tells the story of the long line of kings that came after David, and none of them lived up to that promise. In fact, they run the nation of Israel right into the ground. The book is designed to have five main movements. The story begins and ends focus on Jerusalem, first with Solomon's reign and the construction of the temple, and then in this last section ending with Jerusalem's destruction and Israel's exile to Babylon. And the story leading up to this tragedy is what makes up the center three sections, which explain how Israel split into two rival kingdoms, how God tried to prevent the corruption of Israel by sending the prophets, and how exile became the unavoidable consequence of Israel's sin. The book opens with two chapters about the kingdom passing from the aging David to his son Solomon. And David's final words to Solomon, they're very similar to those of Moses and Joshua and Samuel to the people. It's a call to remain faithful to the commands of the covenant and to give allegiance to the God of Israel alone. But David's words ring somewhat hollow here because David and Solomon then go on to conspire how they're going to consolidate this new kingdom through a whole series of political assassinations. It's not off to a great start. Solomon's brightest moment comes when he asks God for wisdom to lead Israel, and he even completes David's dream to make a temple for the God of Israel. Here the story actually stops and describes the design of this temple in detail, just like the tabernacle design in the Torah. There's all these gold and jewels and depictions of angels and fruit trees. It's all symbolism echoing back to the Garden of Eden. It's the place where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells with his people. But no sooner does Solomon finish the temple that he makes some really horrible choices and the kingdom falls apart. He starts marrying the daughters of other kings, hundreds of them, for political alliances. And then he adopts their gods and introduces the worship of those gods into Israel. Solomon then accumulates huge amounts of wealth. He builds a huge army. He even institutes slave labor for all of his building projects. Now, if you go back to the Torah and look at God's guidelines for Israel's kings in Deuteronomy 17, Solomon is bringing breaking every one. So by the time that he dies, Solomon resembles Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, more than he does his father David. The next section of the book opens with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, acting just like his father. It's a very sad story of greed and lust for power. He tries to increase taxes for slave labor. And under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes reject this. They rebel and secede and form their own rival kingdom. And so now in the story, you have the southern kingdom, Judah, centered in Jerusalem with kings from the line of David. And now this new northern kingdom called Israel, whose capital will be Samaria eventually. Jeroboam also goes on to build two new temples to compete with Solomon's temple in the south. He puts a golden calf in each one to represent the God of Israel. The connection to Exodus 32 and the golden calf, it's all quite explicit. From this point on, the story goes back and forth from north to south, tracing the fate of both kingdoms. Each one had about 20 successive kings, and as the author introduces each king, he evaluates their reign by a few criteria. 
Did they worship the God of Israel alone, or did they promote the worship of other gods? Did they deal with idolatry among the people? And did they remain faithful to the covenant like David, or do they become corrupt and unjust? And according to these criteria, the author finds no good kings in northern Israel, zero for 20. And then in southern Judah, only eight out of 20 get a positive rating, which connects to another huge purpose in this book, and that's to introduce the role of the prophets, key figures in Israel's history. So in the Bible, prophets were not fortune tellers. Rather, they spoke on behalf of the God of Israel, and they played the role of covenant watchdogs, which means they called out idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. They were constantly reminding Israel of their calling to be a light to the nations, that they should obey the commands of the Torah, and so the prophets challenged Israel to repent and follow their God. In these center sections for each king, God then raises up prophets to hold them accountable. And the most prominent prophets are the northern ones, Elijah and his disciple Elisha, right here in the center of the book. Elijah was a wild man of a prophet living out in the desert, and his arch nemesis was the northern king Ahab and his Canaanite wife Jezebel. Together, these two had instituted the worship of the Canaanite god Baal over Israel. And so in a famous story, Elijah challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see which god was real. So they both build altars and pray to their gods, but only the god of Israel answers with fire. After this, Ahab uses his royal power to murder an Israelite farmer and then steal his family's vineyard. And Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice and he announces the downfall of his house. Elijah eventually passes the mantle of his prophetic leadership to a young disciple named Elisha, who asks for two times the authority of Elijah. And what's fascinating here is how the author, he's recounted seven miraculous feats for Elijah, and then he offers stories of 14 acts of power from Elijah. Both prophets were clearly remarkable men, and they played the same role, confronting Israel's kings for idolatry and injustice. And ultimately, they were unsuccessful in turning Israel back from apostasy. In the next section, the northern kingdom is rocked by a bloody revolution started by a king named Jehu, who destroys Ahab's family. And although Jehu was at first commissioned by God, his violence just gets out of control, and it creates the spiral of political assassinations and rebellions from which Israel never recovered. Coup follows coup after Jehu, and each king follows other gods, allows horrible injustice. It all leads up to 2 Kings chapter 17. The the big bad empire of Assyria swoops down and takes out the northern kingdom altogether. In the capital city of Samaria, it's conquered and the Israelites are exiled and scattered throughout the ancient world. Now chapter 17 is key. The author stops the story and offers this prophetic reflection on what's just happened. He blames the downfall of the northern kingdom on the idolatry and covenant unfaithfulness of Israel and its kings. And so God has allowed them to face the consequences of their decision. The final movement of the book tells the story of the lone southern kingdom. And here we meet some very heroic kings like Hezekiah, who trusts God when the armies of Assyria come knocking on Jerusalem's door. Or Josiah, who discovers this lost scroll of the Torah in the temple. So he starts reading it. He's convicted and he institutes religious reforms to remove idolatry and Canaanite influences from the land. But... Judah is just too far gone. The king, right in between these two, Manasseh, he's the worst by far. So he not only introduces the worship of idol statues into the Jerusalem temple, he also institutes child sacrifice. And so God sends prophets to say, the time is up. Israel has reached the point of no return. The final chapters tell the story of the Babylonian Empire coming to invade Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry the people and the royal line of David off into exile. And so the story ends leaving us wondering, is God done with Israel? Is he done with the line of David? Well, the final paragraph zooms about 40 years forward into the exile, and it tells a very odd story. It's about Jehoiakim, a descendant from David, who would have been king if he was back in Jerusalem. And the king of Babylon releases him from prison and invites him to eat at the royal table for the rest of his life, and the book ends.
So it's not much, but it's a story that gives a glimmer of hope that God has not abandoned the line of David. So the question now is, how is God going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, to David? How is he going to bless the nations and bring the messianic kingdom? And to answer those questions, you have to read on into the wisdom and the prophetic books. But for now, that's the book of Kings. Nobody clapped. You say, well, that's so long ago. <clears throat> that's so much information. Well, guess what? Out of first and second kings, eventually you get a savior. His name is Jesus. But every part of scripture is written to get our focus on Jesus and you. So sure enough, when you're reading your Bible, I don't care if you're in Deuteronomy or Revelation, there's stuff for you there. And the Holy Spirit can tell you exactly what it is when you need to hear it. So what I like about it, okay, we're going to cover the history. I'm going to give you information, but that's not why we're here tonight. We're here to have transformation in your heart. Okay, I got a couple over here. To have transformation in your heart, watch this, so that you'll look more like Jesus on Thursday than you do right now Wednesday night in church. You say, Bill, it's been a hard day. Well, you talk to me. You don't know about my day. But I hope, I hope I look and sound and act like Jesus. I mean, that's the bottom line, right? I could sound like hell tonight. You might have sounded like hell today. Now, Pastor Bill... You can't say that. I'm not going to. The Bible will. The Bible will. I don't have to add to it or take away. And so I get to look at 1 Kings, and then I think, okay, what do I need? What do I need to focus in on for you guys tonight? How about 1 Kings chapter 3? Take your Bibles. Turn with me to 1 Kings in chapter 3. That's going to be on page 410 of a seatback Bible. So if you don't have one, grab one right out of the seat back in front of you and, and turn to page 410, 410. Uh, we're in 1 Kings chapter 3. We'll start in verse 4. So I picked Solomon to study this chapter, find out how it overlaps with our lives and what we can learn from Solomon and then James tonight. Do you mind if I jump right to the, the punchline in case you get mad and you don't want to hear about a sermon from hell? The sermon's not from hell. I pray the sermon's from heaven. But how will you know if it's from hell or heaven? How will you know? That's what I want to figure out tonight with you guys. But how will you know whether your heart's from hell or heaven? How will you know? How will you know? Matter of fact, how do you know what's really going on in your heart. How do you know? How do you know? Oh, it's not what you think. It's what you say. Over and over and over again, Jesus talks about that. Can I see Luke chapter 6 and verse 45? These are the words of Jesus. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Translated, all you have to do is hit rewind right now on the recorder. You all have a recorder in your brain. Just hit rewind. <laughs> Go back to this morning, hit play, fast forward, two or three times forward, and then listen to your words today. Your words today will reveal what really is filling your heart. Can I hear an amen? And so if you have a problem with what you hear yourself saying today, the answer is always Jesus and his Holy Spirit. 
and his word so that maybe tomorrow your recording will sound better at 7.30 tomorrow night. It'll sound more like Jesus than it did today. Hey, Nick, do you mind if I pick on you? I'm going to pray. That's kind of the intro. But I'm going to pick on Nick. Did you guys notice that Elisha in the video looks like Nick? Not Elijah. Elisha in the video looks like Nick. That's a compliment, Nick. You know, Elisha is one of the greatest prophets. And, and Nick, by the way, is a prophet. He's a preacher. He might not tell you the future, but he'll forth tell. The, the, the main job of a prophet is to forth tell the word of God. That's a prophet. Nick, I'm sorry, but I might have to pick on you later because you know what? There's a greater judgment for you. Do you know why? Because you're a teacher of God's word. There's a stricter judgment for me. Matter of fact, for anyone in this church, you teach, you lead, you represent the Lord, there's a greater accountability. You represent Jesus. Oh, you work for the church? You're on the board of the church? There's a greater accountability. I ought to be hearing some amens from my staff and elders in the room, but they already know, like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Yes, there is. We had better learn from Solomon and wisdom what that's all about. Amen? Father, I pray tonight that whatever the recording of our heart today, of our words today, whatever that is, I'm grateful that because of your son, we can come quickly, Lord. And some of us might be encouraged, some of us might be really kind of discouraged when we hear the words we use today. I just pray for a fresh grace and a fresh start, a fresh cleansing of your son. And wisdom, Lord, that as we all grow, we're all still growing together, that we really would sound and act more like Jesus day by day. Not because of religion, not because of a discipline, but because of the power of your Holy Spirit. You're still changing us, Lord, and that we want to cooperate with that. So I thank you for Wednesday night. I thank you for wisdom tonight. I pray the sermon would be wisdom from above, from heaven, and not wisdom from hell. I do pray that, Lord. Help us to figure out how to determine that together from your word, and all of God's people would say, amen. So my goal personally is to give you a sermon, wisdom from God's word, from heaven. But how do you know that maybe it might be from hell? You might say, well, Pastor Bill, use your Bible. Oh, by the way, there's a lot of hellish guys out there that use, abuse their Bibles. Hey, Pastor Bill, just talk about stuff. There's a lot of guys out there talking about stuff. Can get people going, but it's a sermon from hell. How do you know? Well, let's go back and see what Solomon did. He wasn't preaching a sermon. He's just trying to figure out how to be a king. He's brand new on the throne. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 4. Tell me you're there. Are you there? Okay, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 4. Now the king, this is Solomon, went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. That's a lot of offerings. Uh, Solomon really loves the Lord. He really does. He offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask, what shall I give you? Can I hear you say ask? By the way, Jesus said you have not because you ask not. Didn't, am I quoting Jesus accurately there? If I came to you and said, okay, what have you asked God for today? What have you asked God for? You should have asked God for something. You don't have to answer me. 
Well, I asked him for a raise. Well, okay, you asked him for a raise. I asked him for health from COVID. Well, okay, you asked him for health from COVID. I asked him for me to give me patience with my husband because I want to take his head off. Okay, he, you can do that too. What'd you ask him for? For my neighbor to calm down. For Bill to preach about heaven and not hell. What'd you ask him for? I'm afraid most of us haven't asked God for anything. We got to church Wednesday. Well, I'm glad you're at church. But what did you ask God for today? Don't tell me you did an automatic where you just got up today and you're going by yesterday or by leftovers from Sunday. By the way, Anna, are you still a waitress? You're not? Okay, Anna's here tonight, one of my favorite waitresses of all time. But I don't want food left over from Sunday, whatever restaurant you're at. And you guys don't want leftovers from Sunday, do you? No. And by the way, we should never be satisfied with left leftovers from God yesterday. What did you ask for? Lord, Lord can, I, uh, can I have the Holy Spirit today? Can I have fresh insight into your word today? Can I have a fresh filling today? Because, Lord, if you don't, then old Bill's going to show up. And when old Bill shows up, you don't know. You might get a sermon from hell. You say, no, you don't know. You don't know. And by the way, you need to ask. You say, I'm not preaching a sermon. You preach sermons all day long. Your mouth communicates, should be, the gospel all day long. Right? Should be. But I don't know about your recorder. You can bring it to me. Let me listen to what you said today. I'd love to listen. To, oh, I got somebody shaking their head. No, you don't want to listen to my. No, you don't. Well, then, then we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. We need a fresh filling of your spirit. Because probably there's a lot of stuff that came out of our mouths that never should have come out of our mouths. That Jesus, well, Jesus heard every word. He keeps track of every word. I'm just, I'm ahead of my sermon. But anyways, we need to pray for wisdom, don't we? Because God shows up and he's not, God is not a genie in the bottle just giving us whatever we want. But there are times when God says, what do you want? What do you want? Be careful how you answer that question. You could answer it with stuff, comfort. I'm a spoiled baby boomer, so just make my life easy. Well, that's not wisdom. Why don't you ask for wisdom? You know the story. Verse 6, Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth and righteousness and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son. That would be me, Solomon. You have given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. Now, oh Lord, my God. He didn't say David's God, my father's God. He said, no, oh Lord, my God. You have made your servant king instead of my father David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Now Solomon's not literally like six or seven years old. He is a grown-up man. But when it comes to running a kingdom, to be the guy in charge, and that you're following in the footsteps of David? And in humility, you come to God like a child? Lord, Lord, I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. I, I don't know what this means to be king. The position you put me in, I don't know what that means. I kind of have an idea. I read the history book on my dad, but I don't know how you want me to act, how you want me to function, what time you want me to get up, where you want me to go, what you want me to say. I don't know how to come in and out. Isn't that the truth? You say, well, I'm glad I'm not king. Now, whoa, 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 who's king of your house? Hey, husbands, 
Well, let me guess. All of you could write the book of marriage, right? You got it down. I tell you what, I've been married 45 years. I'm still trying to figure out how to go out and come in. Hey, Lord, I need some help. Oh, your wife. Oh, you're a child. Your parent, your grandparent, your employee, your student, your staff member. Well, what book did you read to tell you what to do? Well, the Bible, like, amen, amen. But can I not be honest? Don't we need to pray the same prayer at some point in time? And probably every day, Lord, would you be in charge of my life? I'm coming to you like a child. I don't know what you want me to do. I don't know how to do it. So as I'm going out and coming, Lord, would you please, please, would you help me today? Practically. experientially Lord my God you've made your servant king instead of my father David I'm a little child I'm just here all these inadequacies in my life I don't even know what it means I don't know how to go out or come in I don't know how and your servant is in the midst of your people. I got all these people everywhere. They, they, I got all these people, Lord, whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, Lord, here it is. Therefore, remember the therefore. Why is the therefore? Therefore, verse 9. Therefore, give your servant an understanding heart. Give me insight. Give me wisdom. Give me an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern. Can I hear you say discern? Lord, you got to help me so I can figure this out to discern between good and evil because sometimes evil looks good and sometimes good looks evil. Lord, I need discernment. I need to understand. Heart. All these people around me, where did all these people? I didn't ask for all these people. Here I am. For who's able to judge this great people of yours. There's people watching you. And God put you right where you are supposed to be to represent his son. And all those people are different. Some of them like you, some of them don't like you, and there you are. And somebody would say, well, who made you king? Well, I didn't pick it. God did. By the way, I did not pick my gift. I did not pick my gift. God gave it to me. I hate to burst your bubble. I didn't pick Amarillo. I didn't. 42 years ago, God picked it. Ticked off my brother. Now he has to live here with me. <laughs> wow. I think I picked Cindy, and God says, no, I selected her for you and all that kind of stuff. Okay, okay, okay. And then all these people, Lord, I don't know why you send these people. I didn't pick you. Aren't you glad I didn't? By the way, that's why I don't agree with the church growth movement. I just don't, because they say pick who you want. Basically, I'm going back like 30 years ago. What kind of church do you want? Just pick your, pick your group. Soccer moms, pick a bunch of soccer moms. I know a church in town, they pick soccer moms. Do you know why? Because soccer moms have kids, and soccer moms have a husband. And then soccer moms will take them to church in the van that they take their kids to all the soccer games for. I actually know that church. There's some churches that pick cowboys. You know what they call themselves? Cowboy church. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it, but once you pick a group, that's what you got. Plumbers don't go to cowboy church. <laughs> I always thought, why doesn't somebody pick plumbers? You know, like plumber church. You could pick lawyers, but then there'd be nobody there when you do church, like the lawyer church. <laughs> I didn't pick you. By the way, you say, well, we picked you. I don't think so. God drug you in here, and now you're stuck. You know? 
You say, well, how do you hook us? I had one guy tell me, well, I know how you hooked us. What's that? You give us the Word of God, and then you pick it up the next week, and we got to come back to see how it ends. I said, you figured it out. That's, that's the way I do it. Not to trick you, but that's the way God wrote it. So, so how should we act? Lord, we don't know how to go in and out of our marriage. We don't have to know how to go in and out, out and in with our kids, our grandkids, the neighbors. We don't know how. Church, we don't know how. We can act like everybody else and put on a mask and walk around, and it doesn't take long, though, before you're talking through your mask what's really in your heart. While your mask is smiling, but your words are revealing who you are. So why don't we just go back to the beginning and say, hey, Lord, you need to grant us understanding and discernment so that we know how to act going out and coming in in our marriages, at work, in our neighborhood, at church, at school, in Amarillo, in the U.S. of A. We need wisdom, God. You know the great part about asking for wisdom? God didn't say, well, let me think about that. Let me make you pray for that for three years every day with prayer and fasting. Oh, not with wisdom. He wants to give you wisdom, but he wants you to ask. Well, I'll just wake up tomorrow and I'll know. No, you'll have the same empty-headed thing you had the night when you went to bed. You, you have to ask for wisdom. That's the whole point of 1 Kings chapter 3. Verse 10, the speech pleased the Lord. Whoa, the prayer. God was happy that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing, and you haven't asked for a long life for yourself, nor have you asked to win the lottery for yourself, nor have you asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern Justice. Can I hear you say discernment? Lord, that's what we need. We need wisdom to discern. Verse 12. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I've given you a wise and understanding heart. Can I hear an amen? I'll give you a wise and understanding heart. I will. I will. I will. And by the way, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our wisdom. He changes our heart. But oh, how we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. Lord, would you give me wisdom? Would you give me understanding? Would you give me discern, discernment so I know how to go out and in on social media? God might just say, turn it off. Well, Lord, we can't turn it off. People are watching YouTube right now. You better have discernment. Well, not when I get with my sisters and we just have our bull session. You better have discernment. Not with, uh, with the guys at break time and it's just the guys around the water cooler and then we're just really going to talk. You better have wisdom and discernment. How to go out? To come in. I just thought, I know this is so old school, just went through my brain, but I got to throw it down because there's a, a trucker family in our church, and bless them, but I can hear them going, breaker, breaker, you know? I don't even know if they do breaker, breaker anymore. <laughs> Smokey and the bandit. <laughs> but whatever you're on, whatever phone, whatever communication, whatever is coming out of your heart, it's got to get through that filter. God, give us discernment and understanding, I pray, in our heart. And God was pleased to do that. And then he says, uh, let's see where I left off. Behold, I've given you according to your words. See, I've given you wise and understanding hearts, so there has not been anyone like you, Solomon, before you. Shall any like you arise after you? I have also given you what you have not asked. I'll give you a bonus. Both riches, they're coming. Honor, it's coming. So that there shall not be anyone like you amongst the kings all your days. So if you walk in if you walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. You'll live longer. Then Solomon awoke. Woo Indeed, it had been a dream. 
And he came to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, made a feast for all his servants. Can I hear an amen? So what are you asking for? What are you praying? God gives you that opportunity. You can pray for anything you want. Doesn't mean you'll get anything you want, but you would be wise to pray to ask for wisdom, for the power of the Holy Spirit, to give you discernment so that you don't buy solid master cookware and then you're stuck with $1,200 worth of pots and pans. You say, you can't say that. Well, that's what they cost back when I used to sell them in Bible college, but now they cost a whole lot more than that. You need discernment, right? Can you hear an amen? See, right now, you don't know whether this sermon's from hell or heaven yet. You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't. Hmm. Well, how does that look in practice? I mean, if you really got the wisdom, how does that look in practice? Well, the very next story. I love this story. It's like one of the, the first Bible stories I remember when my great-grandmother used to give us, you know, that, that Bible that had the pictures in it and stuff, and she would tell us this story. Then my grandmother would tell us this story. And then I remember, I, I can remember like the Bible and the pictures, and Solomon prayed. He was a young king, prayed for wisdom. And then he two prostitutes. I don't remember my grandmother saying prostitutes, but they were two harlots. They were prostitutes. They both get pregnant. Ooh, out of wedlock. Well, that's interesting. They both have babies. Well, that's interesting. And then they both somehow are sleeping with their babies. I I get that. I get that. You know, mom sleeps with her baby. But one of the prostitutes rolled over on her baby and killed her dead while her son died. She smothered her son. And so you know what she did? She went and got the live baby from the other prostitute and she put her dead baby there. You know what that is? That's yuck. You don't want a roommate like that. But it's a true story. Isn't? Don't you love the Bible? You can't make that up. So there's Solomon praying for wisdom, and then here come two prostitutes, because, you know, the one wakes up and says, my baby's dead, and the other one's going, you know, and then she looks and says, this ain't my baby, this is your baby, and my got my baby, and so she throws a fit, they throw a fit, the police come, you know, and they don't know what to do with them, so they haul them down there to the king's court, and so here you are, just a pastor, you're just on your neighborhood block, you're just trying to do it, and here comes two screaming women. By the way, the ministry's never boring. Life's never boring, and one should be screaming. Do you know why? She stole my baby. You remember the story, right? Solomon's listening. They're both yelling, mine, mine, mine. I don't know how to go out or come in, Lord, but I pray for discernment. Uh, swordsman, would you bring me your sword? Would you divide the child in half? Since you guys can't figure it out, I'll give half to you and half to you. And I can see the swords of raising this. It is my imagination. I, you know, he's about to slice the baby in half. And then the mother says, No! She can keep my baby! She can keep the baby! No, 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 no! Another one says, go ahead and slice him. Because she lost her son. And of course, wisdom and discernment. And Solomon says, give the baby to the one that was going to give it away. That's the mom. You need that kind of practical wisdom on Thursday. Tomorrow. Now let me be a prophet. I'll be a prophet right now. I'll bet tomorrow you're not going to have two prostitutes come to you screaming about a baby. And if you pull out a sword, every social media is going to be mad at you for whatever you decide. So the application kind of stops with Solomon and the baby in that regards. But you're going to have people coming to you screaming about something. I'm 
Mein, mein, mein. And by the way, they want you to be on their side. They're coming to you. They might be in your house. You might be married to them. They might be your neighbor. They might be your favorite person on YouTube. I don't know. But they're coming to you. Mine, mine, mine. And you better have discernment. You better have fresh wisdom from God before you give them a like or a dislike. I guess this is a dislike or whatever. I don't know. Anyways, before you enter into the conversation, before you throw in your support, before you say yay or nay, you don't know whether that's from heaven or hell. You better have fresh wisdom and fresh discernment because everybody out there, everybody has one goal, for you to be on their side, most likely because they want your money. Most likely. Or they want your support. I've got this agenda, I've got this warfare going on, and I want you on my side. So I'll tell you what you want to hear so you'll be on my side. You said, you're, you're talking politics. I'm not talking politics, I'm talking church. Let the world deal with the politics. I got to worry about church. Because everything I just said to you happens in church. And sometimes in this church. Man, you guys got quiet. Tricked you. I tricked you. Not on purpose. By the way, here's a hint. The sermon title's a trick. Do the math. Okay, that's the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 3. Can I hear an amen? amen? My job as your pastor is to show you, well, what does that look like in the New Testament? What does that look like? Well, some of you Bible scholars out there should say, well, that sounds like James chapter 1 to me. And you would be, ding, 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 what up? So turn back to James chapter 1. James in chapter 1. I love the Old Testament. It takes us to the New Testament. The answer is always Jesus Christ. Always. But the book of James is written to believers. It's not written to the world. That we would act like the Lord Jesus Christ in everything we do. Chapter 1, verse 2, that's on page 1481. You guys there? By the way, did I tell you I love you yet tonight? I didn't pick you, but I love you. I didn't pick you. Do you know what? Even besides, okay, you say, well, you have to love us. I know, but I like you. I do. I sit at the back of the room. I watch people come in. I can't believe. I, I watch people come in. I think, wow, they still want to come here. Way to go. Way to go. And I, I like you guys. I do. I have a blast. I really like it when God gives me a sermon. I didn't write this sermon. I'd be crazy to write this sermon, but here we go. Let's find out what it says. Notice what he says in verse 2. My brethren, dearly beloved, brothers and sisters in the Lord. James is writing to family. This is the brother of Jesus writing to family. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. <laughs> knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, mature, complete, lacking nothing. Nobody said amen. You know why? Because it's hard going through that stuff. Oh, Lord, count it all joy. You can only get that. Okay, Lord, I can count it as joy, but I don't think it's joy. You need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to have the love and joy, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and count it all joy when life is hard. Wow, we get to enter into sufferings. Verse 5, but here, in the middle of all that, but if any of you lacks wisdom, I'm going to raise my hand. If any, I lack wisdom, Lord. I lack it, I lack it, I lack it. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. That's what Solomon did, right? So we already know that God loves it when you ask for wisdom. And here we say, if you lack wisdom, we'll ask God. Ask God who gives to all liberally. Wow, how much wisdom you want. Boom. 
and without reproach. It will be given to him. Can I hear an amen? You say, well, I didn't get any. Did you ask? Well, I'll call the preacher and see what he thinks. Why don't you ask God for wisdom and discernment? You're welcome to call me, but it doesn't mean I've got it. Most of the time, what you need wisdom is about are those daily little things that you keep messing up on. You need discernment with the little things that get you sidetracked, and before you know it, because of who you're listen, listening to, that gets in your heart, and that's how you sound. You might say, Pastor Bill, how many times are you going to keep preaching this message? Well, until I run out of text, we haven't been in James or 1 Kings chapter 3. I, I'm not writing it. Oh, can I stop for a second? I told you I, I love you and I like you. Did I tell you that already? By the way, can I tell you overall, Grace Church, you're doing a great job. Overall. I don't have like a meter on my phone telling me how many people have jumped back in on the wrong side of junk. I don't have that meter. And so when I watch our church, and by the way, we had, uh, we had 15 people get saved in our church last week. That's really, really cool. And I'm watching new people come back, and they want to be disciples of the Lord Jesus. I mean, all that. So don't ever say, like, I'm mad at everybody because everybody's messing up. No, what I know is you're actually doing pretty good. But you know if you're messing up or not. I'm just preaching a sermon. And I'm hoping it's from heaven and not from hell. You say, how will you know? I haven't got to that point yet. Okay. Well, let him ask in faith, verse 6, without doubting. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his way. In other words, when you ask for wisdom, really, really ask for wisdom. Wisdom about what? How to go out and come in. How to get through life. How to get through your trials. How to get through your marriage and your kids. How to get through church. Ask for wisdom and discernment. He picks that up again in chapter 3. But as we're turning the page to chapter 3, I want you to see verse 19, James 1, 19. We ask for wisdom. So then, my beloved brethren, Grace Church, my dear family, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's wisdom. Translate it, keep your mouth shut. Keep your ears open. Be careful what you throw down on social media. Don't respond. Don't respond. It's a trick of the devil to get you to respond. Algorithms will drive you crazy. And slow to wrath. I need wisdom, the Holy Spirit. Slow to speak. Quick to hear. Slow to wrath. There is a place for wrath, but it's like a crock pot, really, 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 really slow. The other thing, don't miss it, verse 22, be doers of the word, be doers of the word, not hearers only. I went Wednesday night and heard everything you said. Well, be doers of the word. Not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Don't be that, don't be that. Ask for wisdom. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Doers, chapter 3. Wisdom, how do we know? How do we know? Chapter 3, verse 1, my brethren. He's already said that. Matter of fact, not only that, but he called them beloved brethren. He's reminding them. He's reminding who he's talking to, my dear family, my brethren. These are my bros, my brethren. Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we, teachers, receive a stricter judgment. Be careful, be careful. Be careful. I don't care if you're teaching in Treehouse or the youth. Be careful. Singing on the worship team. By the way, they're teaching us while they sing. You know that, right? You know, preaching a message. I watch every message that comes from this pulpit. Every one of them. You know why? 
I want to know what he said. Not just if it was out of the Bible, but I, I, I want to know how he said it. Be careful. Don't jump into being teachers too quick. Not too quick. Had a pastor come here, a retired pastor. He didn't get a freebie. He had to wait a year. A year. And then still go through the volunteer class. You know why? You want to be careful. Don't be quick. There's a greater judgment. A greater judgment. Now, amen for everybody that wants to teach. If you understand that. Amen. Everybody wants to be on the worship team. Amen. Amen for everybody that wants to be a greeter, helper, usher, coffee shop. Amen, amen, amen. But realize that you are representing the Lord. If I said it this way, we need more wisdom than the other ones. Right? My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment for we all stumble in many things. I'm glad it says that. We all, that doesn't mean we fall, crash, and burn. It means we all get tripped up. We all get tripped up. I get that. We all have a sin problem, right? But not a sin excuse. There's never an excuse. So when you get tripped up, confess that. Ask for wisdom. Don't do that again. I mean, we do. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, okay, here's a secret to this chapter. If anyone does not stumble in word, you figured out the words of your mouth is what really comes out of your heart. Anyone does not stumble in, in word, he is a perfect man. That doesn't mean perfect. It means mature. He's grown up. He knows what's important. Our words are very, 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 very powerful. What we say matters. We check our hearts all the time. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a mature, a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. You get the tongue thing down? Ain't no problem with the hand thing. Oh, man, I can tell this hand to do whatever I want it to do. The hand doesn't do whatever it wants. No, I got this thing figured out. So this thing. Well, how'd you get this thing figured out? Well, this thing only says what this thing is full of. So if I'm smart enough to pray for wisdom, confess, Holy Spirit, would you help me? And then I have to listen to my words. And would you please convict me quick when the wrong ones are coming out? And once you, now I've been doing this for 50 years. This doesn't happen in 50 minutes after you get saved. So if you just got saved last week, okay, there's extra grace for you. But by the way, if you just got saved last week, you're already realizing you can't cuss like you did two weeks ago. Because this has changed. If you're still cussing like you did five years ago, you need to get saved. I'm just talking. So you, cussing's easy. That's easy to get the cussing done. It's all that l other little <laughs> stuff. So hear me. That takes time and wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's perfected. He's a mature man, able also to bridle the entire body. That's the goal. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us. And we turn their whole body. You got this big, powerful stallion. Just have this one little bit on the tongue. Whoa, that horse will listen. Look also at the ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Question. Who pilots you? You might say, well, nobody pilots me. I just say whatever I want. Somebody came up to John Wesley one time. 
and told John Wesley, this lady told John Wesley, I think God has given me a talent to say whatever I want to people. You know what John Wesley told her? I think God wants you to bury your talent. <laughs> you don't get to say whatever you want. Who pilots you? Please don't tell me you pilot you. What, your selfish nature, your old nature? Your, no, no, you can't trust you to pilot you. I think of that country western song, you know, Jesus take the wheel. I don't think it's biblical, but when it comes right down to it, who's got the wheel of your tongue? Who's piloting you? It better be the Lord Jesus. It better be the Holy Spirit. It can't be you. And just don't say what you want to say. You'll be in trouble. Say what Jesus wants you to say. You might still be in trouble, but not with him. Even so, verse 5, the tongue is a little member, it's a little tiny member, and boasts great things. Stupid tongue. See how a great forest, a little fire, kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set amongst our members that it defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature, and it sets on fire by hell. Does your Bible say hell? My Bible says hell. I guess he's writing to a bunch of hell's angels. He's writing to the church, teachers in the church. You got everybody lit up on fire because you got a tongue from hell. Oh, for every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature, creature of the sea, is tamed, has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. Uh-oh, no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil. That's, it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to control your tongue. You can't control it. You can't. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless God and Father, and with it we curse men who have made in the very likeness, in the similitude, similitude of God, the very likeness of God. Are you sure I can't curse him, though? Last I checked, he's made in the likeness of God. Which hymn are you talking about? Take your pick. You don't get to curse. Out of the same mouth have been made, oh, excuse me, out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Notice he's writing to his brother, his family, his Homeboys, my brother, these things ought not to be. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. Can I hear an amen? amen? They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? No, no, no. Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. John Corson said it like this. When you hear gossip, when you hear gossip, pray silently in the Spirit to keep your tongue busy, lest you join in the hellish, hellish discussion. If I listen to gossip, to put-downs, I'm actually an accomplice. 
in that fiery, that fire ignited by hell. But if I refuse to listen and pray instead, the water of the Spirit douses the fire of hell and the conversation dies. Bless you. Can I hear an amen? Oh, that God would remind us when it gets going and somebody's got something on somebody or somebody's throwing something down. And by the way, gossip and slander sometimes doesn't come across like, rah, rah, rah. it sometimes comes across the way. Sometimes it can like, be really nice and then, but, but it's gossip. Where is it? It's amongst the brethren. Where'd it come from? Hell? Well, somebody better put it out. Well, that somebody's you. What do you want me to do? Pray for the Holy Spirit so that what you say or what you contribute, we'll put it out. Well, what if I can't put it out? Well, then you need to walk out. I'm not joking. I went to a pastor's conference once. There's thousands of people there. It got so bad. Everybody's laughing so hard. It was from hell. I took my wife. We stood up. We were right in the middle of the conference. We walked out. I don't have to sit there. You say, when was that? 38 years ago in Dallas. I can even tell you the speaker. If you're in the middle of a conversation from hell, then you either need to put it out or walk out. Amen? Wisdom and discernment. You guys are, I knew it was going to go like this. And the hardest paragraph is the next one. You thought the hard part was over. Whoa, it's just a warm up. This is, to, this is to the church. This is to brothers and sisters. This is what happens in your church, in your city, in your life. Verse 13. It's not only how you talk, and it's to teachers, leaders in the church, but how you live. Who is wise? There's the key word. And understands, there's the key word amongst you. Who gets this? Who understands? Who's wise? Let him show by good conduct. Can I hear an amen? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness of wisdom. Meekness, not boasting. Meekness. Of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, oh boy, that word's so specific. If you have bitter envy, which is the opposite of meekness, and there's people in church at times, they have bitter, they have this hateful, and it, it's envy, it's so harsh. You know, the difference between covetousness, you want what somebody else has. That's covetousness. But envy is when you hate what they have. You hate what they have. You hate it. That's envy. But if you have bitter envy because of who they are or what they have, and self-seeking, oh, there's this other thing. There are some people, they actually have bitter envy, and they, they have this, self, this selfish ambition. They want to do something. It's all self-seeking. In your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. There are some people, some with meekness, and then you got these other people that, for whatever reason, they get bitter, angry. They want what everybody else has. They want that stuff. They're mad that they have it, and they want it. And then they want the position. They want the stuff. They, all of this. Verse 15, this wisdom, this wisdom of that little paragraph does not descend from above, but is earthly, 
sensual, demonic. Is that what you Bibles say? The brother of Jesus writing to the church. Yep. Instead of meekness, it's bitter envy. There's a jealousy. And that turns into demonic, earthly, sensual conversations with the tongue. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above, oh Lord, that's, I don't want this wisdom from hell. I want wisdom from above. Is first pure. It's pure. It doesn't have any kind of sin attitude about it. It's pure. The wisdom from above is peaceable. The wisdom from above is gentle. The wisdom from above is willing to yield. Willing to yield. There's not a stubbornness. There's not an obstinate. There's a willingness to yield. It's full of mercy, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality. Doesn't have a judgmental spirit without hypocrisy. It's not pretending. It's the real deal. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You can listen to a conversation or a sermon. You can read it on social media. And if this is your filter, your filter, John Corson says it like this. I have this, these verses underlined because it is a grid through which I can run any conversation, any teaching, or any word of instruction. I would add any sermon. If there is envy and strife and tension and confusion in what I hear, then I know it's from hell. But if there is purity and peace and righteousness and mercy in what I hear, I may embrace it, being from the Lord. May God give us wisdom. May our words, as well as our actions, reflect his goodness his gentleness, and his grace. Amen? Oh, I know some sermons are hard. I know some of the teachings of Jesus are hard. Oh, I know that. But there's a spirit about it. There's an attitude about it. There's a purity about it. There's a meekness about it. And so, well, what does this mean? You want our opinion? Wisdom from heaven or hell? No, I don't need your opinion about me. I want to know your opinion about you. What say you? Can I see Luke chapter 6 again? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart, what say you, brings forth good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. What say you? For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth, what did you say? today. Amen? You know what's good? Day's not over. You want to redo? Mulligan? Hey, Lord, I need some help. Can I see 1 Corinthians? But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom, amen, from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it's written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. 
hey, you guys survived. Did you learn anything? What are you going to pray for? Wisdom? The Holy Spirit? Help me, Lord. Our wisdom is Christ. Father, thank you for your word tonight. I do thank you for practical wisdom when people are screaming and that we rightly know how to divide the word of truth and not to shove it at somebody else, but to let it be the mirror that we look at, Lord. What words did I use today? What is in my heart today? Who am I listening to today? And that I could have wisdom at least to know my own heart. So it's not much, Lord, I give you my heart again. And I thank you that the wisdom of Christ is the answer, truly is the answer. So I thank you, Lord. Thank you for Grace Church. I pray application to everybody here. You might be here tonight and you just need to get saved. Your mouth is a trash can. It's full. It's never changed. You've never, ever had the Holy Spirit change any words in your life. Not one. You've got the same old heart you've always had. You need Christ to invade your heart and change it. If you're here tonight, and just by chance you're here and you think, you know what? <laughs> I need wisdom, the wisdom of God. I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. If there's anybody tonight that needs to be saved, I'm going to ask you to stand before we close. We're at the end of the sermon, I promise. The end of the service, I promise. But if you need Christ as your Savior, is there anybody tonight just by standing would say, wow, my life's a wreck. I need the Lord. Thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you for this sister that stands. I pray for her. I pray for her heart, her life, and the wisdom of God to rescue her. Bless her, Lord, I pray. Thank you for tonight. Help us as we sing this last song. We trust you, Lord Jesus. Save us. Save us. That we might be a testimony of your grace with everyone we listen to and everyone we get to speak to. It's in the name of Jesus, God's people would say. Guys, would you thank my friend that would stand and bless her?